Okay, so let's go ahead and start another segment here. How to make price discrimination work. So I already alluded before that the essence of price discrimination is to try to get the price as close as possible to the customer's willingness to pay. Now, just before we go any further, the way to phrase this, I think, is not that we're going to try and charge the maximum price possible from every consumer, but instead to think about there's the regular price and then there's the lower price that you're offering some people um, instead. Um, so instead of charging some people a higher price, you instead want to think about there's a high everyday price and then a low sales price or a low discount price. So although the textbook talks about charge a higher price to the inelastic market, I would say instead charge a lower price to the market with more elastic demand. And it's worth remembering the concept of elasticity. Elasticity essentially is the idea of price sensitivity. How price sensitive are my buyers? And there's several reasons why buyers might be more price sensitive. Some buyers might have lower income, so their maximum willingness to pay might be lower, so they're going to be more price sensitive. Some buyers might be more well-informed than others or more interested in being well-informed and buyers who are more well-informed are about alternatives are typically going to be more price sensitive than others. It could be that some buyers find something that's a substitute good and if they have a substitute available that's going to make their demand more elastic. Uh, it could be that you have more competitors in one market than another. The more competitors you have the more elastic the demand is. And this actually gets to one of the most important points, which is that price sensitivity and the ability to price discriminate depend heavily upon the market structure. A perfectly competitive firm, all of its products are perfect substitutes uh, for everyone else's products. So its ability to price discriminate is extremely limited or basically even non-existent. So perfectly competitive firms typically don't price discriminate much at all. Monopoly firms, on the other hand, by definition, if you're an economically meaningful monopolist, there are no close substitutes for your product. So your ability to implement price discrimination is going to be much higher. So we're going to go ahead and see that there's really going to be differences according to market structure here. So, this is one of the rules of price discrimination out there. The other rule out there is essentially you have to try to prevent arbitrage. So arbitrage is the economist's fancy word for buying low and selling high. And in particular, you have to try and make sure that your customers don't buy in the market or time period or whatever that you're charging low prices and then resell that at the time period or price or market where you're selling things at high prices. So trying to prevent arbitrage is often kind of tricky here, um, much trickier with tangible goods than it is with intangible services. Often sometimes firms will try to bind together goods with a service component so that they make the good less arbitrageable, if that's a word, and um, they're able to preserve their price discrimination scheme. Okay, so what are examples of price discrimination? And The examples are basically limitless. Um, I was sort of, you know, going through and 
looking at things. And of course, economists love the example of airline tickets. Um, that's a great example of it. They love the example of prescription medicines. Um, those are great examples out there. Senior discounts and student discounts. It's pretty obvious that a movie seat isn't any more expensive to sell to someone on a Friday night than on a Friday afternoon. So matinees versus prime time. Those are examples of price discrimination. Um, let's see, I have myself a little list here that I drew up here. Um, volume discounts. So volume discounts are a form of bundling, which is a type of price discrimination. Late fees. So some people are more diligent about getting all their bills paid on time. And those are probably also the same types of customers who are going to be more willing to shop around if you charge your higher price. So if you go ahead and you know, start charging people late fees that are sort of more than proportional to the cost of finance for you, then that's going to be a form of price discrimination because that characteristic of shopping around is probably correlated with the characteristic of also paying your bills on time. We could have um, outlet stores. So if we charge a much lower price in the store that's, you know, two, two hours drive out of town, Part of that's because real estate's cheaper two hours out of town, but it's also true that only the people who are real bargain hunters are going to drive two hours out of town to buy at the outlet store. When we have periodic sales, you know, some people are just like, I need a new pair of pants, I'm gonna go in, I don't care if it's Labor Day sale or whatever, but some people are gonna plan their buying more carefully and they're gonna wait for those periodic sales. So that's a form of price discrimination as well. We're basically looking at how impatient or patient someone is. And generally, people who are more patient and willing to wait for the sale are also the more price sensitive people. So we want to offer them a selective discount. Many forms of selective discounting are forms of price discrimination. We might price things differently in different zip codes. So if you had a, a sophisticated website, and you were selling people things through e-commerce and you knew that people in one zip code either had higher income or there were fewer competitors for your product in that zip code, you could go ahead and charge a higher price in that zip code for shipments to that zip code. And notice that would be a, a fairly effective way of automating your price discrimination. Um, to some degree, random variation. So if we sort of randomly vary the price of the product, some people will pay attention to that, and some people won't. So if you look at what goes on in a typical supermarket, you know, you'll see that you know, it might be that we have a standard everyday price, and then we're going to go ahead and put the pot product on sale at random intervals. And it might be that you know, some people buy the store brand always. They're really price sensitive. And some people are going to buy the national brand always, because they're really committed. But then there are some people who flip back and forth, and those are the really price sensitive people who we can sort of um, steer to one product or the other out there. Um, customer loyalty programs, where you know if you get a certain number of punches on your card or something like that, you get a free latte or whatever, are ultimately a form of price discrimination because the person who really values that extra latte at the end of the week is going to make sure they always bring that card. That's your price sensitive bargain hunter. The other people aren't going to engage in that kind of behavior. If we have lower rates on weekends or higher rates on weekends versus weekdays, that's a form of price discrimination. There's just you know endless, endless, endless examples of price discrimination out there. All right, so that's some examples that we want to talk about. Mm -hmm.